meeting of the Board of Trustees for Lexington II. First item on the agenda is the invocation and pledge of allegiance. I'll turn that over to the Vice Chairman, Mr. Bailey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, tonight we have with us two students from Airport High School, Ms. Courtney Worley, who's going to lead us in the invitation, and Ms. Deanna Dickerson, who's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Courtney is a senior at Airport, where she's ranked eighth in her class with a GPA of 4.7543. She's been a member of the student government for three years, serving on both the cabinet and the executive council. She's a member of the Beta Club, the National Honor Society, the French Honor Society, and has served on the yearbook staff for two years. Courtney received the Lou Wolf Outstanding Untraditional Officer Award and the Tracy McCoy Leadership Award, both for her time and efforts in student government. Courtney plans to attend Midlands Tech for two years and transfer to Winthrop University for a degree in journalism. One day she would like to work for a magazine such as the National Geographic where she can capture images and stories while traveling all over the world. Deanna is a senior at Airport High School where she is ranked fourth in her class with a GPA of 4.9375. She's a member of the Beta Club, the National Honor Society, the Tri-M Music Honor Society, the Gifted and Talented Program for Musical Performance, and the B27 Club. She's also received the Murtis Walker Award Deanna has served in the community by working with Harvest Home Food <coughs> and Habitat for Humanity, and occasionally she has helped with tutoring her fellow students after school during the Nehemiah project. <coughs> Deanna plans to attend Winthrop University and major in journalism as well. So, if um, Courtney, if you will step to the podium and lead us in the invocation, and then Deanna, when she finishes, if you will lead us in the pledge. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, we thank you for this day and for bringing us together to highlight and celebrate the accomplishments of the students and faculty of Lexington II. Please guide our hearts and minds in the spirit of fairness. In your name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item is the consent agenda, and there is no objection. The agenda will stand approved as um, submitted. Next, we have public participation period. We've had no request to see you. All right, thank you. We'll move on to reports on honors and accomplishments of student and staff. Thank Mr. Penn. Madam Chairman, Board, tonight we have several groups we'd like to honor. It's always an exciting time when these, especially the uh, ROTC at airport, come before us. The first, I'd like to, since the first Five, four are from airport. I'd like the airport administration to come up. They can help us present the awards and congratulate the students. Thank you, sir. We'd like for this time Jimmy Germany to come up as well as Colin Richardson. These two gentlemen lift weights, if you couldn't tell it by the way. <laughs> Colin, I, I did yours uh, a couple of years ago as a 10th grader, and uh, you've gotten stronger from what I understand. I told him this was not a demonstration, not the rear ranging. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy plays sixth overall in the varsity state championship high school strength meeting at state championships. Jimmy, we appreciate you representing Airport and Lexington School District too. Keep, keep playing. <laughs> At the same meet, Colin Richardson, he won the state championship.
Next up, I'd like to invite Sergeant Major Ferguson and the airport ROTC to come up front. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ms. McRae, she's a counselor at Brooklyn Casey High School. She was selected as Midlands winner of the South Carolina Department of Education Office of Career and Technology Education Cape Counselor of the Year. handout too with our honors and accomplishments in it so if everybody will take one and read over it and that's our report tonight madam chair thank you mr Hinton. congratulations to everyone excited all right next we'll move on and uh, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business and it's the second reading of revision of board policy jkaa high school discipline policy and JKAB Elementary Middle School Discipline Policy. I'll we'll turn that back over to Mr. Hinton. Um, we bring for second reading the same policy. There's no revisions made. Uh, it stands as it was last time we presented it to you. Mr. Hinton. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we approve second reading for the high school discipline policy JKAA and JKAB for the um, elementary middle school policy. A motion, do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Kessler. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who you know who's doing the three in a row, but I don't know if I got any more. Next, uh, we'll move on to new business, and uh, the first item is first reading of the 2017-18 proposed general fund budget. Ms. Richards, please. Thank you. Uh, last for me, I brought to you a draft of the 17-18 uh, general fund budget based on the Senate version. Um, in case you're not aware, I'm sure you're probably aware that the um, Conferees have not decided on a full budget yet. They're, they're meeting this week and they'll come back on the 23rd to finalize that conference report. So until then, we have still presented for first reading based on Senate. It's a balanced budget. It's the exact same budget that you saw last month. By the way, with the deep of the agree. 79 million. This again is just the legal um, cap that we really believe should we choose, this does not include a millage increase, but should we choose, this is our legal cap, 2.6 mills. <coughs> and please stop me if you have any questions. This includes a base student cost of 2,435, which is an increase of $85 over the current fiscal year, which is a little over a million dollars for us. Also, we have um, the addition of a portion, 1% of the teachers 2% retirement increase and 1% of the um, everybody else for a little over at one point, almost 1.2 million in addition. Um, we also have, I've been sharing with you each month, our property tax collections coming in very good. We're right now a little over 5.5% more than what we collected this time last year, which is a good thing. So you'll see that conservative estimate based on those numbers of where we are this current year. We'd like to hope to see, we see that same type of growth next year. I don't know that. For a total increase in revenue of $3,683,577. This budget includes um, additional staff for 1.4 occupational therapists, three growth positions for teachers, and the fringe on those. It also includes a $2 an hour increase for bus drivers. It includes um, changing our salary scales for the classified, but not the increase in the upper uh, years experience. An increase in the special ed budget due to our federal monies being a little less, and not keeping up at the same pace that our expenses are growing. And an increase in utilities. It also includes an increase, the step increase for all eligible staff, the fringe, there's the cost portion of the 2% increase on the retirement and the projected 3.4% increase on health insurance. 
for a total budget of $79,559,857. Now put in, in your place, should the conference committee not go with the Senate version, um, the things that we would recommend eliminating in this order would be the occupational therapist, the growth positions, and the changes to those salary schedules. We're hoping that, that we're going to pass closer to the Senate version and not have to do that, but that would be the recommendation should we know on the 23rd. We'll know on the 23rd, or hope to know on the 23rd, what that budget will be so we can keep you updated. But this is first reading, and the recommendation would be to approve first reading of the budget for 1718. The general fund budget first reading for 2718. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bingham. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is consideration of launch price increase for 2017-18 school year. Each year, the um, Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 stipulates that uh, school districts have to keep their paid lunch price in line with, um, to show that we have enough funds to cover those that are not covered by the federal reimbursable free and reduced meals. And this, they do provide a tool to assist with that calculation. And the tool again this year showed a 10, dot, 10 cent, I'm sorry, increase for both elementary lunch and secondary lunch. For elementary lunch will be 265 and secondary lunch 290. Breakfast remains the same at $1.40. The recommendation would be to increase lunch prices by 10 cents. Breakfast remaining the same. Do we have any answering questions? I have a question for me. When I was reading the new business action agenda item, it looked like as a result the new paid lunch prices would be two fifty five for elementary and two eighty in middle school. Mm -hmm. just like that was last year's. Very ten cent increase. Yes. Right. So, okay. Well unless that was I think it's just maybe, maybe maybe. Yeah, okay, the new lunch would be a ten cent on the two fifty five and two eighty cents. Yeah, it's got to be So it actually be 265 and 290, yes. Okay, all right. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the recommendation for uh, increasing the lunch for a new school year. All right, I have a motion to have a second. Second. Second from Mr. Giles. In discussion, Mr. Beal? Is um, the amount that we generate for that, what does that leave left over in the um, um, lunch fund? The fund, the food service fund. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what kind of fund balance. We did have a positive fund balance last year uh, for the school year ending 15 16. I can't remember right off the top how much that was, but it does remain in the black. Is it? Just barely. Bare, yeah, it was a little more. I think the previous year it was just barely, but this past year I think we it was a little better than just barely. We also started the uh, dinner programs last year. We expanded those to more, and so we do do a little better with those programs as well. So that helped a lot. Because I know in the past what we've been able to do is use some of the lunch funds to help pay for some of the cafeteria right. that would equipment be great. to serve them. Mm -hmm. So do we need to look at anything more than the 10 cents so that we help pay for some of the equipment that it takes just to serve the lunches? We, we can. Um, I don't know if even, you know, an increase, like what would you be proposing in, in an increase? I don't know how much that would generate. Right, yeah. You have to tell me that. We don't have enough right now to cover equipment. I mean, there's not a huge fund balance that covers equipment. So I would have to go back and do more calculations to see what that might would be. I would just think we need to start incorporating that cost mm -hmm. into the cost of the lunches. Because if not, then we're going to be forced at some point to. Pony up right. equipment mm -hmm. for lunches that really should be 
self-supported. We have been for, uh, very fortunate to get some grants for the past several years to, to increase, to upgrade some of our equipment in a lot of our kitchens. Um, I think we have another one this coming fiscal year as well, so that, that does help, but we can look at that. Well, I would suggest, just like we've got painting schedules now on buildings or whatever, we need to plan for the eventual um, obsolescence of the kitchen equipment. It's just not going to last but as long as the building's going to last. Right, and then you have to weigh that with the collection rate also. I mean, we, we you know, aren't getting 100% collection. Now, I don't know what our collection rate is right now on lunches. We have to have to check with uh, food service on that, but that's kind of a, the way that, how much you want to increase it to the point you're not going to get people to pay it. So. But well, I agree. It's always been a struggle, but we've tried to mm -hmm. figure out ways to right. put in place for people yeah. to, to make sure that. Mm -hmm. But we can we absolutely look at that. I've got, a, I guess, a, a related question to that, and just from an all standpoint, is that normally where districts would actually fund that kind of equipment? Obviously, I absolutely agree that we need to be planning way ahead of time. Is mm -hmm. it normal to do it out of that budget, or is that something that comes from, like with normal building? It's a little uh, both. both because there again, a lot of food service, you know, the, the intent of the fund is to get even at, at minimum. Um, and you actually, the State Department of Education requires that you not have a large fund balance, that you have to have at least a three month. And if it's any larger, then you have to have a plan for what you're going to do with it. Now, one of those is you can buy equipment and things like that. But a lot of districts don't have a, you know, some districts are lucky to have a huge fund balance. But it's not commonplace to have a huge food service fund balance, but it is a little bit of a hybrid of who pays for it, a little bit of food service, and then depending on what it is, if it's an entire kitchen, that's usually not something that can be covered out of food service, but some upgrades in equipment is what that can be. So. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Um, Dr. Jones, I don't know if this is a policy or you just have some really, really good administrators out there who just do this, which I know you do have some really good ones, but I do know that a lot of your schools, and I appreciate this, are requiring all students, even at the high school level, they require to turn in the sheet with their parents' signature, even saying no on it, and I think that's really, really important <coughs> because that for the kid, it doesn't give the stigma. Of, I'm, I'm definitely having to walk up with this sheet. I'm green reduced. And for the parents, there's a lot of parents who are too proud to apply for that too. And I think we all know a lot of our money is tied to how many kids we have for green reduced. So um, for the principals that have been doing that, I appreciate it. If it's a district wide policy, great. If not, I would encourage other principals to do that because I know that you know, every year when I get parents complaining, why do I have to sign all these forms in high school? I'm like, look, because it helps other kids that you, know, you may not need it, but it helps other kids not to walk up and you know, be embarrassed. You're talking about the form. Yeah, every year we have to, I have to sign the yeah, free reduced lunch Yeah, every, 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 that. Everybody this year, signed, everybody's signed yeah. regardless. Yeah, this year we um, really pushed that because we didn't have a lot of the forms back in. And just to also stress that that free and reduced, our free and reduced calculation helps us get other funding as well. So we really did a push. They, schools were great. <clears throat> this brought the assistant principals in. They went back, called, you know, made sure we had forms on everybody because it, you're right, it, it is very helpful to get those back. So, yes, we, they were very helpful this year. And well, in this, this year, that was for, for Kelly, just about $300,000 in uh, retention funds because of our free reduced lunch rate that came in. So. Mm -hmm. Filling those forms out makes a lot of difference to the district. Can you write it? That's so we're, we're, we're trying. Mr. Bain. So I understand we're only doing it at the high school level? No, we did that across the district this year, yes. So it's across the district. Every student fills those forms out, need it or not. We're trying to get those back in. We, we can't force the parent, but we're, we're trying at least to at least get those forms back in. This year we had a lower than normal return on those forms, the free and reduced form, the applications back in. Well, when you say you, you, you try to get them and you can't force them, certainly there's ways we can. Well, we're looking at that for next year. One of the um, issues we have is we have um, our um, non English speaking <coughs> parents. So this year we, we've talked about for next year actually having some an interpreter there that can help them read the form. Uh, we do have it in Spanish. We do have some um, who are not able to read, so we, we talk about having some interpreters there to help have a day that they can come in 
especially at the elementary level, and help them fill out those forms as well, and just to understand how to fill out the form. Yeah, because I mean, whoa, I know what happens is they, they don't fill out the form, mm -hmm. then they eat lunch for three months, and then they say, but I'm free and reduced. Mm -hmm. Then they go back and fill out the form, but we can't get reimbursed for the three months, and they don't want to pay for the three months they didn't get. Right, and then they end up having to, to write it off, exactly so. So anything we do, mm -hmm. well, so we're, we force parents to <laughs> fill out the forms, needed or not, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. I agree. Well, and the good thing is I think, at least this year, they all came in a stack of a ton of forms. So it's not like that was the only form the kids yeah. were bringing back. It was in a stack of a ton of forms. I didn't think it may have had a cover letter. It was like, please fill out every form and, and stuff like that. So, and it was a district letter. I mean, it wasn't school specific. I mean, certainly, I mean, you register every year, and you have to, I mean, there can be ways to say that form's got to be filled out as right. part of registration. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, right. we don't charge them fees, but they got to register. <laughs> right, exactly. One follow up question, and this is a little bit off the rabbit trail, but it's something I think that would be very important, might be helpful too. Are we in the process of moving to online registration for our parents? Because that would be very easy to have a version in Spanish we, online as well. And we have a version online. We are, and Marcel can speak more to the registration, and we're also moving towards, and I was going to update you guys on this in June, but we are moving towards online fee payment as well for, yes, for parents. As a um, parent that has a child in yes. elementary, middle, and mm -hmm. high school, mm -hmm. and I'm building the same thing out five times, mm -hmm. like, if I could go to one website and fill all stuff out, Hey, everything at once would be awesome. Mr. Josh, we're moving to InfoSat. Um, actually, we did a pilot starting in January. Mr. Essie and our IT department were very helpful. We started with those kids who were registering for early childhood classes this year. So we did a rollout, a soft rollout. And in July 1, everybody would register online. And basically, to the point of the forms, they can fill out everything online, scan Excellent. it in, upload it. And along with that will come the fee, it's a, it's a separate <laughs> program, but it'll also generate the fee that goes with the parent can go online, click in InfoSnap, go in there, pay the fee online with a credit card. We're not, that, that's kind of phase one of that rollout. Phase two eventually will be to have schools will be able to put, you know, t-shirts, football ticket sales, um, play sales, and those things on there. And then phase three would be eventually to have um, we, we won't have card swipers at, yet at the locations but that would be the third phase is to put that card you know so that they can pay or if you came to a football game you could potentially pay for it, it with, with your debit credit card so that is coming but we, we will have the phase one ready with for registration in july this year Thank you. so as part of that registration until they filled out all the forms they can't say it's complete. Yeah, that will send you a trigger that you have missed part A or part B, part C. Got to fill it all out. Before it gets through. And then, yeah. Marcella, do not let that go through unless that lunch form is filled <laughs> out. It's what Mr. Buckingham's telling you. And now, those are not only the parents that are doing it online. <laughs> it was interesting because when we rolled it out January 21st, a parent actually registered at 1201. <laughs> she was waiting on it, so yes. she was able to register it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go back for uh, the, to obtain a motion for the item B consideration of the lunch price. I, think, yeah, I, yeah, I thought you asked the question I think first. Cindy, Cindy okay. made the motion. I've got a second. Any, okay, excuse me. Um, any more discussion? discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda is consideration to authorize administration to apply for titles one, three, and neglected and delinquent NND funds. Ms. Gowan. Thank you. Good evening. Tonight I would like to request authorization from the board for the administration to apply for federal funding under Title I's Part A and B and Title III. We have some information in your packet regarding the federal funding. That first figure you see there represents what our final allocation was for fiscal year 2017. Below that is our estimated carryover, which would be the maximum of 15%, which is all that we can carry over into the next fiscal year. That figure won't be finalized until the books are closed out um, at the end of June. 
Our preliminary allocation for 2018 is unknown at this time, but we were told recently that we could expect level funding, which means no drastic reductions or increases. Um, and we will know the final amount, we'll know the preliminary amount sometime in June, but we'll know the final amount in October. As always, we do have mandatory set-asides. That's things we have to take off the top before we allocate money to the schools. The only one that has a percentage attached to it that's required is parent involvement, and we have to set aside 1% for that. Lexington, too, sets aside more than that because we support the STAR or the Childhood Program. One change with the Every Student Succeed Act is previously that 1%, 95% had flowed through to the schools, and that has been reduced to 90% now. We also have to set aside money off the top for homeless. There's no percentage attached to that. Um, in our district set aside, the <coughs> administration is listed out what we currently have um, in our administrative budget. I'll call your particular attention to the foster care transportation. That's new. Under the Every Student Succeeds Act, there's a responsibility between the Child Welfare Agency, which for us is DSS, and the school districts to develop procedures regarding transportation. And that has to do with if um, it is considered in the best interest of the student to remain in their school of origin. So someone would have to pay to transport. So it could be <coughs> DSS paying, it could be us paying, it could be cost share between the agency and us. My plan is to set aside some money just in case. It's kind of hard to guess what that might be because I have no idea you know, what the needs might be um, because we've not done this before. Um, other district set-asides are support for Countdown to Kindergarten, which is our program in the summer for our four-year-olds rising up to 5K. The allocations to the schools are based on the March 22nd free and reduced lunch count, the final 135-day report, and just so you'll know, KC Elementary, the way we figured that, we put the enrollments of um, Davis and Taylor together, minus the four-year-olds, because we can't count four-year-olds, and we put their free and reduced lunch numbers, which again, to reiterate, are so important for us to have those numbers correct. We combine them to get the poverty for uh, KC Elementary, and they'll be allocated money according to that. Um, the Title I Part D neglected and delinquent is the money, the little tiny bit of money we get for Three Rivers. Um, you see the 2017 allocation there. Again, the uh, preliminary 2018 funding is unknown, but because it's in with Title I, we also expect level funding for that as well. No sharp increases or decreases. And we have listed there what we spend money on at Three Rivers. Title III, which is the funding for English speakers of other languages. Their 2017 allocation is listed. 2018 is unknown. And then the only thing we can spend that money on is professional development, summer school, and after school programs. Now we'd like to answer your question. <coughs> Mr. Bain. Madam Chair, I move to authorize the administration to apply for titles one and three in the elected and funds. I have a motion and a second. Second. A second. Any discussion? I'm just going to go to question. Okay. Just, just for information. Just, since it's new, you may not have an answer to it as well. The foster care transportation. Mm -hmm. So when they say that, you know, the school of origin is in their best interest, mm -hmm. who determines if it's in their best interest and then how are we on determination? Who's paying for the cost? What the DSS says is supposed to be a collaborative effort, and we've had a couple of trainings from the Department of Ed, but what they're expecting over the summer is for DSS and the school districts to get together and work out the procedures as to, for example, who makes that determination if it's in the child's best interest. But those procedures are not in place yet. So this is all this is all new to everybody, right? So awesome. on, on transportation yeah, too, it's going to be negotiation kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Any more discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is uh, consideration of the first and second reading of recommended revisions of administration rule IKF. Dash R, 
graduation requirements. Uh, Ms. Williams, before Dr. Haverdevitz gets started, this is a little bit different in the fact that we've asked for first and second because it reflects changes in state legislature and or regs from the State Department. So it's not a Lexington to change its compliance with either a rig from the State Department or something that's new in, in the legislature. So we aren't, we aren't trying to rush you all. Okay. Mr. Bailey? Mr. Chair, I would make a motion that we uh, waive um, policy and consider first and second reading <coughs> of the recommended revisions to administrative rule of IKFR graduation requirements. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Then we're going to go to consideration of first and second reading of recommended revisions of board policy IKE, the motion retention of students. Yes, ma'am. All of the um, policies or revisions that we're bringing to you tonight will basically follow suit as to what Dr. James has said. We just went through our school board policy to make sure that we're in compliance with what the models suggest. And so we just want to ensure that we are abiding by the state law and that our policies um, follow suit. So at this point in time, the administration recommends approval of first and second reading of the revisions of board policy IKE, promotion and retention of students. And basically we just address the South Carolina Read Succeed Act and that policy. Mr. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we raise board policy and consider first and second reading of recommended revisions to board policy IKE promotion and retention of students. I have a motion to have a second. 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 Oh, Ms. Kessler, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we will move to consideration of first and second reading of the recommended new administration rule ILBB-R state program assessments. Administration recommends approval of first and second reading of the new administrative rule ILBB-R state program assessments. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we wage board policy and approve first and second reading of the recommended administrative rule ILBB-R state program assessments. I have a motion. Do I have a second? <laughs> second by Mr. Giles. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we will move on to consideration of first and second reading of new board policy IHAC, social studies, education. Administration recommends approval. Mr. Bain. Madam Chair, I make a motion we waive board policy and um, consider first and second reading of recommended board policy IHAC, social studies, education. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Giles. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next, we have consideration of first and second reading of recommended revisions of board policy IHAM, health education. Administration recommends approval. Mr. Graham. Um, Madam Chair, I make a um, motion that we waive board policy and consider first and second reading of recommended revisions to board policy IHAM Health Education. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Ms. Kessler, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will move to consideration of guaranteed maximum price for Springdale Elementary Early Site Package. And I'll turn that over to Mr. Eisenhower. Madam Chair, members of the Board, Dr. James, uh, we bring several items to you tonight for consideration. First is the uh, guaranteed maximum price for Springdale Early Site Package. Uh, I will say to you that uh, we have, we still have some issues that we're trying to work out with the bus loop. Um, Office of School Facilities has indicated that we're going to have to write a letter basically stating that we're going to monitor and control some traffic uh, there. And I just want to make sure that you understand that uh, there are still a few little items that we need to work out on that one little uh, part of, of this early side package. 
but uh, we've looked at all of any possible solutions to this, and uh, we even looked at going back to Parish Pond. Um, none of those are viable options at this point. So, uh, uh, we, Dr. James and I are still working on one other potential solution, uh, but we won't have an answer to that, and, and, I, and, and it can only help us if we get to that. But I, from a construction standpoint, uh, I don't think we're going to improve on what we have. So, with that said, uh, I'll ask uh, <coughs> Tom, Mr. Bill Cram to come up and present to you the guaranteed maximum price for the first site package at Springdale Elementary. Great. Excuse me, good evening, Madam Chairman, Dr. James, members of the board. Great to be here with you tonight. Uh, we received bids on the site package from uh, multiple contractors, very competitive bids. We vetted them thoroughly to get a complete package and presenting to you tonight a guaranteed maximum price of $2,574,310 for the site work related to Springdale Elementary. That cost is within budget. And uh, you know, we think it's going to be tight on the overall budget when we take bids on the rest of the building, but we feel good about it. Can you say that amount? Yes, sir. Two million five hundred seventy-four thousand three hundred ten dollars Madam Chair, the administration recommends approval of uh, the contract in the con. Madam Chair, I would make a motion that we approve the guaranteed maximum price for the early site package from MB Con in the amount of $2,574,310. Motion, do I have a second? Second. second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, the next item on there would also involve MB Con. Okay. I would like to give you a consideration <laughs> of the guaranteed maximum price for the Cake Center. Uh, that's going to be uh, built uh, next to the new elementary school at Casey. And I think Mr. Cease is going to just give you a quick review of, of this project. Right. Thank you, Mr. Eisenhower, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. James. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Just to uh, kind of refresh your memory on the, uh, the work at the Cape Center that uh, Mr. Cram will be presenting the bids on tonight. Uh, we, we wanted to uh, also commend Bernie Atkins, Johnny Wright, Rick Coleman, Mr. Eisenhower, Tommy King. It's been a very collaborative process during this, uh, this the, the planning of uh, the Cape Center. It's uh, it's very exciting. Uh, the diff various different uh, programs that will be offered in the uh, in this new Cape Center. And just to kind of refresh your memory. The Cape Center is on the left-hand side of the uh, drawing here. Uh, 12th Street runs across the bottom of the sheet. Uh, Taylor Road is up and down on the right. Bulldog Lane runs across the top of the sheet. And so uh, you can see the proximity to the uh, new elementary school. It's approximately 115,000 square feet. Uh, the various different uh, technical education programs as, where, as well as the higher tech type programs will be housed uh, in this uh, facility as well. The health sciences, sports medicine, graphic arts, uh, IT, robotics, really exciting type programs to uh, show off the work that uh, the students in Lexington too are, uh, are, are doing, as well as the more traditional uh, technical education type programs, welding, building construction, uh, law and public safety, and uh, uh, horror culture, auto mechanics, and auto collision. So uh, excellent programs, exciting programs. We wanted to make sure that the facility was uh, very innovative looking, but yet uh, fits in with the campus. So the brick matches the existing uh, middle school as well as the new elementary school. So it all kind of ties together. And this is sort of the uh, main entrance that the uh, visitors, so we think we have some wonderful opportunities to create partnerships with uh, you know, various different corporations along uh, 12th Street. So really some uh, exciting uh, uh, opportunities uh, for the district. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Cram to uh, present the, uh, the, the GMP. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Todd. I would like on Todd's comments about being a great team effort working with the administration and designers to 
put together a cost-effective package. I'm very pleased to report to you, and I want to commend <coughs> the MB Committee team for pulling this together. We got great bids on this project. Great coverage across the board, a lot of good subcontractors, very competitive bids. Uh, again, we are within budget at $26,030,000. It's 26030000. Madam Chair, the administration recommends approval of the guaranteed maximum price to end the time. Mr. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we approve the guaranteed maximum price for MBCon from the amount of $26,030,000. I have a motion to have a second. Second by Ms. Kessler. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next. We have consideration of guaranteed maximum price for Brooklyn Casey High School baseball, softball, canteen, and storage building, baseball press box, and tennis court addition. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just uh, to kind of refresh your memory on what uh, the phase one of the uh, renovations and uh, additions to Brooklyn Casey High School will be at the uh, sort of uh, uh, top left corner of the facility is the existing softball field and the existing baseball field. We'll be adding a new entrance to that complex, the Springs Corps complex, and um, it'll include a new press box, a new concession and toilet and storage facility, and uh, that is the, uh, the base fit. We've also added a uh, new netting that we discussed last time at the board meeting here that will uh, basically uh, increase the height for the backstop as well as extend down uh, the third base line approximately 100 feet past the, uh, the third base dugout at the height of 30 feet. So hopefully that will uh, take care of uh, you know, foul balls pull down the uh, left field line that may interfere out on the 7th Street and across into uh, the neighbor's yard. So that is the, uh, the overall base bid. We also uh, bid a new tennis court uh, associated with uh, the existing tennis courts. Um, and Jenny will present uh, one tennis court as an ad alternate. We also looked at uh, having an additional court and there, there are approximately two places that the second tennis court would fit on that site. One is down the third baseline of the uh, baseball field immediately adjacent to 7th Street and immediately adjacent to the first and second uh, existing tennis court. The other alternative would be to pair the two courts, which uh, you know has some pluses and minuses. Uh, you know they would all be aligned, uh, but to fit two courts between the existing tennis court and the existing girls locker room, we have to kind of shift it forward toward. Uh, the old Indigo driveway, and uh, that causes us to, uh, to modify the driveway, modify some storm drainage work, so there's some cost associated with uh, putting that there. But Jenny has that cost broken out, and she can uh, share that with you uh, tonight as well. So that is basically the uh, overall scope of the work for, for phase one as we move forward into, um, you know, the the other phases of uh, BC high school. No, Chairman. Yes, a question. Sure. And I know we were talking about adding the extra tennis court because we're trying to make sure we get all the players in. But then I was looking at in the paper the drawing of another school district, which was trying to do something this week, and they had five tennis courts. And I think that you can play the one, two, three, four singles only going down to the top because don't usually the second doubles, and I'm, not, I'm looking at Mr. Giles because mm -hmm. he's a tennis parent, but don't they usually the second singles? Your second set of doubles is your number one, two player, which only go that as a tiebreaker. So, so do you really need, are there going to be six people at all times yes. playing? But ideally, yes. So it's, and the point of that is, you know, if you're going to just add one, that's not really helping a whole lot of the flow. When the BC, like you look at airport, and it has six courts. It really speeds a matchup because all the courts being used, all, all the competition positions are being played at the same time. 
versus right now at BC you have four after wait somebody finishes, then your number five stars, then your first double star. You only go second doubles in the case of a tiebreaker. So you might not, every, every match you don't necessarily need six points. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. If you're going to run all of them at the same time, yes. Which is what you try to do just from a time standpoint. One question for you, Todd. Did y'all look at tightening up the existing to see can you gain the space that you need? Because we do have an exceptional amount of space between like if you look at airports courts versus BC courts, we have a huge space in between the courts at BC that really is not necessary or used. Right. So, uh, Brad, we did not consider uh, tightening the courts uh, of the four existing because of the fence configuration with the uh, angle and the, you know at the the midpoint line. Sure. Uh, we did consider tightening them up uh, at this location, but because there's an ele uh, existing electrical panel box that's located right here, yeah, and, and it would be cost prohibitive to kind of redo that and squeeze it any tighter. Uh, so really it came down to you know, pushing it out forward and letting it slide out in front of the, uh, the existing locker room. And it still gets really close to the uh, locker room. So there's some storm drainage work that has to be done and things like that. So, uh, you know, again, I think it's uh, it'll work, but it's uh, it's a financial consideration. Miss Bree, talking about my question there, because mm -hmm. I've been on, I've been involved in tennis before, and from what I remember, number one guy or girl plays on one court, number two plays on the second court, number three plays on the third one, number four I like counting on my fingers, number four plays on the fourth court. At least one, of, only only one of the two doubles, which you might need two, but at least one of those two doubles is a combined team of these four people, right? Yeah, no, but that's your second set of doubles. So you only go to that in case of the tiebreaker. Right. So you have six competitive, you have one, two, three, four, five singles, and then you have doubles. So right. if you end up with one team wins three courts, another team wins three courts, then it goes to tiebreaker doubles, which is your number one two player. But those guys will be finished playing, so what the next <coughs> time to be open is what I'm saying. But you only go to that in the event of a tie. So you, you ideally you want to have six courts playing at all times and once that's done, then most of the time the match is over. You don't go to your number one two players again unless you have a tie. So to get, ideally, you want six courts. That's that's the point. Can you do it with five? Yeah, you can. It just it just stretches things out, just like it does in the four. And my point when we're doing this is like, if we can't add two, it's not going to do a whole lot of extra good to have. Don't, don't get me wrong. I want to add one. Yeah, that's all we can do. Ideally, you want to add two. I just wondered because like on the last drawing, I just saw in the state newspaper of another school district. They were had a whole sports complex they're trying to get past. You saw my downtown. Mm -hmm. no, that's that's just strictly and, and geographic over there and you know. And they're kind of a well that's kind of a little small campus like what we are, and yeah. they had five and that's probably all they could into it. I know what you're talking about, and that's awesome enough too, but um, ideally you want to have six if possible. So Todd that the number six on the third base, yeah. it, it really can get in there? I mean, just it, how much? Safety for the yeah, I mean, I, seriously, the how much is on that other side? Yeah, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's a recommendation. We just wanted to show you that it would fit, that it goes right up to 7th Street and it goes within 16 feet of the foul line of the baseball field. So that's the left field line. Left field line is pretty, it's pretty close. <coughs> All right, so go back to the to the other one. The pair. Yeah, there you go. All right. Now, what what are you encroaching so what, on down there? Yeah. Go? So what happens if you kind of follow this existing line? The the current road configuration extends right across and then curves back. So what we would have to do is reconfigure in the uh, so to provide. Um, provide a sidewalk and the ability for cars to continue to pass and you know that's the emergency egress and ingress path for or emergency vehicles uh, so that's what that would entail as well as there's a large storm drain line that runs down in the go that will be impacted too 
that will have to buy the one that's under the baseball field? There's, uh, there is one under the baseball field right now, and so it comes right across the center field. We would pick it up, if we did this, we would need to pick it up outside, just outside the center field line, and bring it across to tie into the main line on the end of That needs to be done at some point. If, if you do the tennis courts, the two tennis courts, it needs to be done now. If not, it can be done uh, later on when you're doing some other uh, site work associated with the uh, and when you say it's close to the locker room. Yeah, it's within five feet. The fence, the fence here for that second court is within five feet of the girls' uh, locker room. And you know there's an exterior door right there coming out of that back locker room. So it's, it's not. Another question, uh, maybe an alternate four here. Now, do we not own the corner right there across the old Indigo and Sons? Do we own that corner right there or no? No, no we don't. No. I was thinking we own a small portion of that. Okay. It's kind of a small piece, but it's yeah, it's, that part. I don't think it's big enough, Brad, to put it right there. But well, my concern, too, um, you know, with obviously that's a good in a while there, too. You got my these places for spectators, right? Bleachers. <coughs> As far as watching, yeah, all the spectators will have to watch from this end or either from behind the end line, which is standing, put, standing room, yeah, typically put screens and stuff. But if you add the one there, Todd, you don't have to do anything with the drainage, you don't have to do anything now. You, know, you can just yeah, add one, you just add one because we're staying far enough away, we're staying in 70, 70 feet off of the uh, base of the existing building. So if you just add one, that gives you room for people to, to watch? Right. You, we would create a green space then right there and some bleacher space so they'd look down, you know, from that end. So you'd have good visual access to, you know, those two or three courts and then on the other end, those two or three courts. Todd, if we had to have the sixth court, if we put it down the left field line, have we explored the cost of a net up? Beside that court there. So we, we have uh, priced a net that uh, basically runs 100 feet from here down. I'm uh, talking extended on over to protect that tennis court. Right. We could. We don't have that price at night, but uh, we could probably fall for it. And to go back to Mr. Giles' question, and he can answer it because I am not a tennis person, so I. So Five does no good. Uh, don't get me wrong. If, if all we can get is five, we absolutely <coughs> want five. I'm just saying, ideally, you want ideal six. situation is to have six courts so that but all five absolutely helps. I mean, sure. Okay. Um, don't think about the teams all the all together. Not your physical education classes. How many do they need? It depends on how many in the class. I mean, you got four per court. You got 40 kids in your class. You only need 10 courts, but you know. <laughs> but five is better than four. <coughs> sure, okay. sure. That's what I'm asking. I, I'm trying to. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to hold anything else up. So it may be a situation that we just agree on everything else and look at maybe some options on tennis stuff. But yeah. um, any clue of what it would be to look at tightening up the other four courts? I'm just saying that if we tighten the other four up, I know it involves some other rearranging and resurfacing, but you can move those other two up and may, maybe avoid some of the other issues that you're having. Yeah, we can look into that and certainly get, uh, we have some tennis, we had, I think, good participation and bids on the uh, tennis court, so we can uh, go back to the uh, three or four bidders that we have and uh, ask them to price that up as well. And you would have to move nets and all that stuff. Yeah, if, if you re-strike really everything, really re all resurface time. all the courts and uh, shift all the posts down. And, so, and I don't know how you want to handle it. But the, we uh, have a price out. tonight on five. Is that correct? Yeah. Both, both here. You have two different, okay. Both. All right. Even, right. If you, uh, even if you tighten it up, you still got the electrical <coughs> issue there that may still prohibit getting another court in there. Right. That's re the real cost factor is the infrastructure stuff. So. Yeah, because it's providing all the power for all of the existing lights. And that's the other thing. I mean, when you start thinking about relocating all of the existing lights for four quarts, you know, I think it's going to be right. 
great deal of cost decision. I'm just trying to find a six number. It's just that's fine. It's not a yeah. shoe worn. Yeah. yeah. It's like that's too tight on that third base line. <laughs> that's tight. Okay. All right. Let's, any more questions or can we kind of continue? You ready? Sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Madam Chair, Dr. James, members of the board, thank you for having us here tonight. I think we've kind of covered a lot of the details. I'll try to clarify um, our cost options. So I've given you all a handout which lays out our options and feel free to um, chime in and ask questions as we go. The base total um, is our proposed GMP for the base scope that Todd um, previously described. This includes the concessions and restroom building, the press box, all new um, netting around the backstop at the baseball. It also includes the demolition of two existing structures that we have to take down and move in order to build these two new buildings. And we're also putting in a temporary stair down to that lower um, parking lot of concrete stairs to be able to access that little lot um, prior to the construction of the arena. So we think that'll help. So um, the, the GMP that we're proposing for the base is $1,025,342. Please keep in mind that the site plans are still, um, they're still working on those. So the grading and the site utilities or allowances that we've included, so we hope to improve on these numbers. Um, we have really good competition, but it's a tough market right now. There are a couple of numbers that we think that we can still negotiate and hopefully improve on this number as we have um, in the past. So then we have our add option. The first add option is again for the first tennis court, and that would just be adding one tennis court, the associated light, fencing, curb, and sidewalk with that um, tennis court. And that add option is $117,832, and that's all costs all in, including 5% contingency. And that base price also includes a 5% contingency. So add alternate number two is for the two tennis courts as drawn. The construction documents that we priced were the two tennis courts um, that were closest to the building and which required the relocation of the road. So add alternate number two includes the two tennis courts, two lights, fencing, associated curbs and sidewalk, and then relocating the road. And the price for that option is $229,608. Now, this storm pipe that we've been referencing has been an issue evidently for several years. It has been recommended by the um, civil engineer that it be replaced. I had a conversation with them today, and we um, put an allowance of money in it, which is where we're coming up to $91,971. We would hope to improve on that number. But it is, done, it is understood that the best time to replace that pipe would be now, such that you don't have any damage later when leaking in the gym um, because of the existing condition of that storm pipe. So if we install two courts, I think it would be the recommendation that we go ahead and replace it now. If we install one, we may want to go ahead and do it now. Of course, that would be your option, but it is the recommendation of the um, civil engineer that that be replaced at some point in the future. So now, is that pipe supposed to alleviate the lake that gets in the baseball field when it rains or is that supposed to protect the building like when the gym's flooded what does that pipe do what's the purpose of the stormwater pipe what's it supposed to do well i think it does all of what you just said so it will it will help alleviate the pond that is created right here on heavy rains because what's happening now is um, there's a there's a sleeve that runs through an existing pipe that runs under the gym. That sleeve is undersized. Okay, so when we add a new pipe that runs basically from here out to the main 66 inch pipe that runs in Indigo, it will alleviate some of that ponding and on heavy rains. Um, it will also prevent water from running underneath the gym, which is something we need to do at some point in the future. <coughs> And it's a 30 inch, it's currently specified in the drawing that I think was done about three or four years ago as a 30 inch concrete pipe that goes up and connects to that 66 inch pipe up in Indigo. Currently it's about an 18 inch pipe underneath the, uh, underneath the gym. So the stormwater pipe is not running out there on the road. It, it's, it is what's coming from the baseball field over to the 66. It runs perpendicular into a road. Correct. We're going to tie into the one that uh, runs along. So that's a completely, that has nothing to do with really the tennis courts. That's just a separate issue of taking care of that. 
Right. It, it is something that we would recommend doing if we do the two tennis courts because we wouldn't want to tear up the tennis courts to do it later. You have no pathway if, if we build these two courts. Yeah, yeah, but even if we only put one in, why would you not recommend it? it we, we are. We're just saying if we put in two tennis courts, we think it's a must. But you could do it later, so if, if you only have one, you could do it. We if you're going to make a green area with bleachers and that, I would say I would recommend that you go ahead and do that now. So you're not having to pull the leaders up and you can see everything up and have to go later. In the area where the sixth court would be, so you are having that as a viewing area. Yes. It's 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 done. Done. It needs to come out one of that gym. Yes. It, needs, it needs to be done. It needs to be done, and there's no question. Now, I will interject because I've done a flood study in this area. I don't know that it will solve the flooding in the baseball field right. because yeah. the 68, the 66 inch pipe will back up because of what's downstream of it. So it's needed so we don't flood out the gym, you know, from underneath. The pipe needs to be fixed. But just don't fully expect that it eliminates all the flooding problems at school. Because the, the, there's got to be something major done downstream to solve that. <laughs> it depends on the size of the rain. But we think in most cases it will help. When it starts backing up, starts running out of the those grates and popping the grates off, we know that at that point it's not helping us. Is there any plan that you're aware of that the city of Casey's ever going to fix their problems? They are certainly looking to figure out ways to do it, but it, I mean, it's a monetary issue and it, it's, you know, as in all cases, the people who have a problem are interested in them fixing it. And the people who live up the hill that don't have a problem, they don't want to pay anything to fix it. So they're trying to figure out ways to get it done. But it's not easy. Mr. Bam, what about those pipes that are on, um, what was the pipes that are sitting in front of DC in the church right now? That's not the pipes. You know how they've got, they got the all these pipes sitting down on um, Oh, they're replacing all the water lines in the city. Uh, that's not good. That has nothing to do with storm drain. There was a there was a misprint in a news article that I did read that somebody had talked to the city and they indicated it was going to improve the storm drainage. That's not true. It, these are just water lines. They won't have anything to do with with flooding through the storm water. So Todd, this storm water pipe that we just piped in the water from the center field fence to baseball field over to Indigo Drive there, straight across. Correct. Just outside the center field field, so it's off the play field. I recommend we do that with this project regardless because it will alleviate some problems so that you I think we need to do the pipe. Yeah. No matter what we do, we need to do the pipe. Because yeah. that pipe's the problem. So the next one's the I think we need a size because we'll go with one port or two ports. Right. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion. Um, um, where do we get? Right, because we, we, do we have any more? We can do a motion where we do the base, the uh, storm water, and either we do alternate one or two. Okay. okay. Ms. Brown? I have a quick question. Okay. And if you don't have this, I'm, I'm not going to question it. I'm going to ask Howard that you may not have, or Kelly. But how much did the six air, six courts we just did at airport cost? Was it 100000 a quart? Or? Yeah, it was, uh, it was over $600,000. It was? And you get the economy of scale there to a certain extent, too. Is there any way, in, in order to make a motion, you've got to know which one you're going to go with. And right now, we need to know if, if the cost of tightening up those courts and the addition of one other one would fall somewhere in that 229. It's going to be a lot more. But you realize tightening up those courts <coughs> still may not cure that electrical problem. That's an issue. That, that's, that may not. That's a great point. Because that may not clear you're not going to gain anything by tightening up the four courts because yeah. the electrical yeah, mass is still... Okay, so we have to decide. Is it going to be one or two courts? Right. Right. Or 
And even the, those two are too tight. And even and tight enough to be here, they won't fit in line with the electrical stuff. I mean, I just think it's too close. You know, so yeah. I understand. Yeah. I had not considered. Yeah. He had a road that's tightening up too much already. You got to get there to drop those kids off. I mean, it's just getting too tight. So basically, you're saying we've got to go with one four and be happy. And replace the storm Well, that's that's not an option as far as my box is concerned. I think you're in the majority side. That that's got to be done. <coughs> that's not an option. Okay. So the only option we have is one or two ports. And right, right now, I'm hearing that we're going to have to go with one. So do I have, Mr. Frank? No, Chair, I make a motion that we accept the guaranteed maximum price from Thompson Turner for the base total of the million $25,342, add alternate one at one seventeen eight thirty two, and add alternate three at ninety one thousand nine seventy one. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Ms. Kessler. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Next, we have consideration of Airport High School baseball press box schematics. Madam Chair, at this time, we'd like to have uh, Luke Perry come up and present, um, along with contract instruction, I guess, the uh, schematics for replacing the uh, press box. At Airport High School for the baseball field and also doing some ADA work there. Um, that is uh, very timely. Thank you, John. Uh, Madam Chair, Dr. James, members of the board, um, thank you for the opportunity to present this this evening. Um, these are schematics, so we do welcome any feedback or uh, design direction, uh, would be very helpful. Um, so this is just your existing conditions right now, and this is the area we're looking at. So this is the existing concessions and restroom building, baseball field, um, and existing bleachers. There is the sixth tennis court there. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, that is, that's, 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 a, that's a, um, a Google Earth image, and they haven't updated that. So we will update that. Um, this is pictures of what the concessions and the toilet building is now. Uh, so the front here is where the concessions are sold. These are the two um, men's and women's restroom. And then this was kind of a storage as well as utility area. It has a sprinkler and the electrical in it. Um, so one thing we want to look at is what's the most cost effective way to <coughs> renovate this to get ADA bathrooms without a significant amount of cost. So this would be our proposed plan. Um, we would not be doing any work in, in the canteen or the concessions, but what we be, would be doing is essentially reconfiguring these two existing bathrooms to make one handicapped male and female um, restroom, and then two additional bathrooms on the, on the back side that would not be handicapped accessible, but would keep the same fixture count. Um, one reason we looked at that is just the, the depths just weren't quite big enough. We would have to make it bigger if we wanted to do two pictures in the restroom. And this also allows us to keep the sprinkler and electrical controls, electrical panel in the same location um, to help minimize costs. Um, next, we want to focus on the press box. Um, where we're looking at working is right here where the existing um, sets of kind of double features are. Um, with the press box, ideally, we'd like to try and get it on the center line of the field so they have a, a good um, view. So this would be a, a, a conceptual proposed site plan. Um, so we're proposing a plaza to kind of link the new press box with the existing concessions. We've got some landscaping in there, um, concrete so you can provide an ADA accessible pathway from the parking spaces to this facility <coughs> and then also to ADA designated viewing areas um, at, at the press box. One thing that we're fortunate of, um, we're familiar with the, the grade here, the press box is already elevated, so we think we could save some money and not do a two-story facility. And in speaking with the coaches, um, they were okay keeping the um, storage down in the Eagle's Nest that we're gaining by building the new field house and that would consolidate storage, and they prefer this to just be the <coughs> 
Um, so a fairly utilitarian design, uh, just an open area with a counter at the front, sliding windows, a small closet that could use to store IT or other things, other valuables. And then we're also proposing to remove the prints from the front of the press box so that there's a good view. Um, but we would gate and secure this off on either side, and this would be a coaches only area, obviously, because you know, we could run down the hill from, from that place. And this is a conceptual rendering just down the third baseline of, of the press box. Um, we would propose to use the same brick colors um, that we're using in the other areas of the school the red field brick with the tan. Um, brick accent, and then it would be a hip roof with architectural shingles and gutters around to help uh, any baseballs that might be. Any questions? Are the roofs and the brick work going to match the existing concession stand? <coughs> at, the, at the softball field, they don't, you've got a metal roof and red and beige brick, and then on the Press box, it's all red brick with a uh, uh, shingle, shingle roof. And it's, I mean, it, it doesn't even go together. Please make that look like it. Yes, supposed to go together? We can do that. We definitely depend on uh, matching the brick. Uh, another thing we can look at the concessions has a blue metal roof, and this right now is architectural shingles, but it could very easily be a metal roof. They need to be alike. Okay. The, does the metal roof pose any problem with baseballs in the roof? We would probably want to look roof. at a stronger steel and a, and a thicker gauge on it, and that's something that we could um, you know, look into. Any roof is not really meant to withstand baseballs uh, repeatedly, but uh, we can consult our roofing consultants about maybe a stronger metal gauge in that, in that area. If you put a standing seam metal roof on there, wouldn't that be better than a baseball hitting up? 30-year architectural shingle. Yes, sir. It, it, it may, yes. is, there, is there no seating at all in front of the press box now, right behind it? Um, no, ma'am. We're, what we're showing there is kind of a, a coach's area or athletic director <coughs> area. The coaches could get out there, uh, but we have not shown any seating. We could definitely look into that. Um, we didn't want um, pedestrians and fans in, in that area. So you're moving the bleachers. Uh, yes, sir. Um, as you can see, the, the main bleacher actually used to be almost in the middle, and we're proposing moving that one adjacent to kind of have a larger home side bleacher, and then relocating this bleacher that was about here um, over a little bit. And we'll be pouring new uh, concrete slabs underneath the whole area because we know that's going to make them. Would it not be more feasible to do an ADA basketball field <coughs> instead of going in and busting slab and piping through? Um, yes, sir. And, that's, and, yeah, that's, and you're also losing the tennis team uses all that for their tennis, tennis balls and their, all the rackets are staying in there. Are y'all giving them another place to store stuff? Uh, uh, yes, sir. That's a good question. We are. The, uh, the Eagles Nest actually, I didn't bring those plans, but there's a storage room that we've made accessible from the out exterior, and um, that has been told that's where tennis um, wants to go, and, and that's where they prefer to go. As far as the cost um, effectiveness, we did um, look at it briefly with contract, and we'd be happy to explore that further. One thing, there's no other infrastructure, so you wouldn't have the cost of running the plumbing to this building, um, and we tried very hard to kind of keep the fixtures um, along the same area where the plumbing is now um, to be more cost effective, but we can definitely research that. Yeah, because what I was talking about, you could just add the bathroom on the end of the building there, and you're still at a unisex, mm -hmm. one unisex handicap, and you can tap in right where it comes out of the existing building. Mm -hmm. So you're not busting slab and you're not losing storage space there that they desperately need. Is it not more expensive also to have four separate rooms or rather than have one room with two stalls in there or something? This, this seems to be expensive to me. We can and we can break down the cost of that further. It's because we're not really conditioning the space. Um, it's just exhaust fans and, and a, with a built-in unit heater. It's, it's not very expensive space. Um, but looking when we looked at the size and layout and where the plumbing is now, there just wasn't quite enough room um, in this area here yes, to get the clearances that we need. It, it just 
we would be trenching further to try and I think what you'd have to do is do a, a wall here and a male here and a uh, women's here and it actually would be more concrete work. But it's definitely, we definitely looked at a lot of alternatives. Um, so probably more reasonable than concrete in the spring. Yeah, do you want me to speak to that? Yes. <laughs> I'll let our <coughs> boss guys speak. Uh, also, I was looking. This gray, that square footage over the Eagles nest is in storage. So you will pick up some extra storage over there. Uh, the reason I thought we were looking at this was because of the toilet camps. We need to have maybe a dedicated toilet camp or <coughs> the other camps. That, that is the goal. We're not trying to increase or decrease the fixtures, but to give you a dedicated um, ADA accessible. We, we can explore adding the end. Well, I think the question is, um, Mr. Key is making a really great point. If you don't touch that concession stand and, and that um, bathroom situation or storage situation at all, and the money you got dedicated right there right now to go over to the press box and then just make that press box, like you said, you only need one handicapped accessible stall, multi-set, unisex, unisex, and um, <laughs> Yes, the, the concrete would be easier not to take concrete out. What is going back with are the new of wall on the which would be easier, but we are planning to take concrete out once we have work on the inside. Is there a requirement to have male and female ADA, or you just need to have ADA? I don't know. This is a unique situation because we're not necessarily increasing capacity, um, and so we're just trying to improve the existing situation so there's um, leniencies. That happens. If we were adding more bleachers, then it would be a whole other uh, bucket of farms. But since we're not, if it is an option, if you did want to renovate these bathrooms, to just looking at adding what we would call probably like a, a family bathroom, it's one of the things that they like to have for um, for assembly type spaces. So if you need somebody who has needs assistance or a young child, um, those are things that they encourage. So I think that would be um, agreeable to OSF. We definitely run it by them. Um, it's your discretion on whether or not you want to renovate the concessions. But you're not going to renovate the existing, all you're going to do is eliminate the marijuana and toilet in the future, correct? No, we're, we're renovating both sides. They'll, they'll be renovated, so there'll be new new facilities. Um, and there is a trade back of building an enclosed space versus renovating. But we can, I think we can give a contract a pretty quick sketch and let them run the numbers on either one. Um, that could help you make the decision. We have numbers on this tonight. We have the numbers. Uh, we're working against the budget that was set by the staff. And right now, we're a little over where that budget was. We're still exploring some other benefits. contractors and get some more numbers from them. Numbers initially, the ones we got in, they're slightly under the budget we set for this. And if you recall, you approved this project in our CPIF budget. But we'll explore the other opportunities. Yeah. Are there any other? No, I was just saying, I think the family bathroom concept in the press box that Mr. Peter said, I think it makes a lot of sense. It makes it help you guys come in, you know. The budget same point may help out too. Family representative. We could definitely investigate that as well. From an ADA standpoint, will we be in compliance with what is required for ADA restroom access with a family bathroom? <coughs> I would definitely want to run that by office school facilities once again um, because it is an existing condition that we're improving um, their preference my, my understanding would be is if they had a male and a, and a female but that's not as been as big of a push um, as before look we're we're the board is guaranteed that if you start all this renovation that we aren't going to get somewhere along the line and somebody from the office of school facilities or Americans with Disabilities or whomever comes back and says you don't have enough restroom facilities for the seats, you don't have enough handicapped spaces, wouldn't it be easier to plan 
to have a little more than to get uh, in that and then have to say we didn't plan enough. And, and I don't know, I don't know what that number is, but I know that there is a number. Yes, sir, there, there is a number. And we can do a count on the features um, and get a seating count and, and do that formally. Um, once again, because we're not increasing capacity, it's not something you necessarily have to do, but you are right that somebody could potentially in the future bring a complaint and say you did all this work. Why didn't you? Well, the thing that scares me is we've dealt with things where when we get overhead, we think we're doing well, and then all of a sudden somebody says you got to bring it up to today's code when you could fairly easily raise that press box and double your restroom space just by restrooms on the ground level floor. But the thing I don't want the board to get into, and I'm not an architect, is the fact that we're sitting here in the board approves to, to upgrade the restrooms that are there, make them handicap accessible, and then all of a sudden we count seats and we're not ADA compliant. I, I understand that concern. It sounds like we need to do a account and we can verify that information. I like the consideration of the rest of the press box in the hall right there. That's something that we need to schedule for us to do in the effect of the press. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are now going to be, we have almost, we're almost on letter M. Um, so we're going to take a five minute break uh, since we're going all the way to Y tonight um, and we're just going to do exactly five minutes so five minutes, we've got five minutes. That thing your chief operations in the amount of $14,992 for the new construction at Pine Ridge Middle School. Can you make a motion we uh, approve the contract for $14,992 to A3 Communications for installation of cameras and new construction at Pine Ridge Middle School? Second. I have a motion and I have a second on Ms. Branham. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Madam Chair, for item O, we'd like to take that off the agenda. We've already included that into previous pricing. All right. For item number P, we have Dr. Dixon Brooks, who is going to present, and I'm not sure if he's going to have his committee <coughs> involved or not, or if he's just going to do it himself. Oh, they can come up if they want to. <laughs> in, in, in preparation for this, let me just say that I appreciate Dr. Brooks and the other principals that are involved uh, as a committee to do this research, talk to all the municipalities. What we're trying to do is basically establish a standard for a digital school sign that we can put out for bid and get uh, hopefully a quantity price over the next three years. And uh, I, I commend this group for doing an outstanding job of working with those municipalities and bringing you this recommendation tonight. I appreciate that. I appreciate the opportunity to be with y'all tonight. Just to give you sort of an overview, I did have an opportunity to meet with all of them, either the town administrator or the ordinance people. This is sort of a rundown of the different rules and zoning and ordinances. In KC, you can see that there's a sign maximum of 75 square feet. Bless you. Thank you. Um, many of them need to be a monument type style. You can see no higher than seven feet. Those would be BC High School. Um, my school, the New Cape Center, um, Airport, Fulmer, do not fall into that. Um, but there's also some frontage waiver that we could use to take our sign up to 12 feet. Um, Casey must approve um, those as soon as possible for uh, the new school and my school for replacement. Um, and then digital display cannot be more than 6% of the sign. In West Columbia, all schools that uh, we're talking about are in the residential area, which comes with more restrictions. You can see sign maximum is 20 square feet in West Columbia, one side on one sign on each street. Most of our schools are on the school corner lot, so we could put 20 
square foot sign on one and 20 on the other. Um, no sign taller than four feet if within 10 feet of the road. If it's outside the 10 feet, then we can go up to six feet. Monument style also required in all those locations. Um, we did talk about a variance and there is um, would be a variance needed with West Columbia with what we're going to propose. Springdale, um, and it's not currently allowed in Springdale, but they do have a public hearing tonight. As a matter of fact, um, what they're proposing tonight would be a sign maximum 50 square feet, monument style with no height restriction, digital display cannot be more than 55% of the sign. Um, we can work through a variance with them as well. South Congaree, there was no maximum in um, size, height, or monument versus pole mounting. And in Pine Ridge, um, it's not currently allowed, but there is possibility of working through a variance with them as well. So we are excited about the opportunity to really promote our schools. You can see our current sign um, as it was last week. Um, in many of our situations, and I have been on um, ladders, and I have friends who have trucks that we sit on the back of that truck about every weekend changing the letters on those signs. And obviously, the new digital displays would give us an opportunity to change those literally from anywhere we have. Um, internet access and then our um, recommendation or proposal um, to be able to really promote our schools would be sign maximum <coughs> of 45 uh, square feet um, height maximum of 12 feet width maximum of 8 feet with a digital display not to exceed 60 percent of the sign and then other considerations that we like that in places cloud-based software to allow us to be able to change those signs and um, <coughs> wireless communication also with those signs. So we can change them from our phones, from iPads, from our computers, all of those type things. So that is our pro proposal to be the district standard. Um, as Mr. Eisenhower has mentioned previously, there is money and some of our schools are ready to cover that. And as we move forward, that's what we believe all our schools could use to help us permit our schools and our district. And I may point out to you that uh, you approved the installation of five of these <coughs> signs at the cost of $25,000 per. And this committee has worked uh, and they feel that uh, these this standard will uh, be in compliance with uh, that budget. Mr. Payton. Is that 45 square feet on one side, or do you have to count both sides? One side. So it's 90 square feet, because it's a two-side, it'll be a two-side sign, I assume. That's correct. Okay. And we chat with uh, vendors from pricing sample and see if we get quantity discounts. Yes, sir, that's our intent. <coughs> That's why we're trying to adopt a standard so sure. we, can, we can start negotiation. Ms. Brady. I make a motion to approve the committee's recommendation of the district standard for signs. I second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Next, we're going to move on to consideration of official mascot for Casey Elementary School. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. James, we have with us tonight Sheriff Freeman and Alvin Allen. You may remember them from the work that they did in naming uh, Casey Elementary. Uh, they've also gone out and done some work to uh, try to get uh, others to buy in on their proposed mascot. So with that, take it away, folks. Uh, Mr. Chair, Dr. Chase, members of the board, um, we have met with um, both of our schools. I'm from Davis Early Childhood Center for Technology, and I'm pleased with Taylor. And um, we got together to and got a vote together and had to pull both schools to what mascot would be in their favor. Yes, we shared uh, this image and another image on a Google form, and we sent the we shared with our entire property staff, and 99 people responded. 8% of them 
chose this image as the digital mascot. One question I have: same color scheme, or this is just, just the, the actual design of the uh, overall? We've actually been looking into incorporating the school colors this fall um, into the November and gray. That was great. Very friendly. Spread it. So we're doing. I think a motion to approve the mascot as um, recommended by the. Official KCL history. Yeah. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion, Mr. Freeman? I would want to make sure that they do use the school colors in that, not just. I know that's what you said you're looking at, but I would assume the motion means to use that with the school colors. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank y'all. All right. Madam, Madam Chair, for item number R. There's a lot of information there. I hope you've had a chance to read through it, but just to put it in form red language, basically what we're doing is we're trying to work with the contractors that are working on these sites, and we're trying to incorporate painting of these facilities as the construction is taking place so that when the teachers come back in August, they will basically come back to as new a building as we can provide them after the construction. So it's going to cost us a little more money. We, uh, we don't over budget on a couple, or actually uh, three of these, but what we're proposing to cover that uh, is that we include Saluda River and Springdale uh, painting into their base bid whenever we get those guaranteed maximum prices on those. So we'd like to recommend that we go ahead and approve of these painting projects as presented. Okay. So that's motion. Motion to approve the painting bid as recommended by administration. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next, we have consideration of bids for new rooftop HVAC units at Airport High School roofing project. And Madam Chair, I apologize, but I should have also added roofing into that as well. It's HVAC and roofing at the same time. But we do have uh, two different contractors, but it has to take place simultaneously. But these are also in your CPIF budget. I bring them to you only because the HVAC pricing went over the budget somewhat, but the roofing was under the budget. So we basically have um, uh, a net savings of about uh, 44 or almost $45,000. But we'd like to award the roofing contract to Southern Roofing Services in the amount of eight, $889,900. And the HVAC to McCarter Mechanical in the amount of $377,500. Okay. Madam Chair, I make a motion to be award the roof contract to Southern Roofing, you know, 889,900. We need to do this two motions. Two. And award the um, contract for the HVAC to McCarthy Mechanical at in the amount of 377,500. $377, I have a motion to have a second. 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 Ms. Kessler, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. For item T, Madam Chair, we are, uh, also have this in the CPIF uh, budget and we'd like to remove lockers at airport high school as well as painting, UVCT, so on and so forth. We do have some asbestos that we will have to abate and that we have some hallways that have three layers of tile. Uh, and the bottom layer is asbestos. So uh, that ran the cost up on that one just a bit. It does, again, come in $5,000 over the budget that we presented to you. The, but we'd like to go ahead and award the contract to contract construction in the amount of $330,000. That includes a $10,000 contingency. No, Joe, I'm sorry, 230000 I'm sorry. Okay. 
We like the other hundred thousand. Y'all can't play that. Don't worry. Madam Chair, make a motion that we would award the um, contract to contract construction for the removal of blockers and the associated work at the airport high school in the amount of two hundred thirty thousand dollars. Motion to have a second. Second, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. And Madam Chair, the next item basically is continuing with that. We'd like to just show you the uh, VCT colors that we're planning to use, and it's the same colors that are going into the airport field house, the new one. Uh, the principal we, uh, we got with him today, and he, he is very pleased with the colors. If you'd like to see those, we're happy to show them to you. If not, if you're willing to trust us, we'd like to just go ahead and prove those. But you want to hold them up there. It's basically blue and silver. Silver or gray. <laughs> and we do have a pattern uh, that we're going to use in doing this, and we apologize for not having that for you tonight. But basically, we're going to do uh, a two by two block in the center of the, of the uh, hallway. At various increments with some uh, wood lines basically of like three uh, squares coming out of the wall occasionally as well so um, it'll look good so we'd like to ask that you approve those colors. All right. I'll take a motion. Madam no, Chair, I move that we um, approve the administrative recommendation for the VCT colors and pattern in the airport hospital hallway. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. And for item B, uh, it's basically the same thing as we're asking it uh, for uh, in Casey High School. We're asking for locker removal with the exception of lockers, I think, in the east wing and replacement of flooring in the, in the hallway corridors as needed in the amount of $189,693. And that also has a ten thousand dollar contingency, and that would be awarded to Thompson Turner. It's all the lockers except the ones in the east wing. Is that correct? Yes. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we award to Thompson Turner contract for removal lockers for BC High School with the amount of one hundred eighty-nine thousand six hundred ninety-two dollars. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Ms. Kessler, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Madam Chair, this last one, um, I, I'm going to ask you to, if you would, consider tentatively approving of this because we're still trying to figure out what the target is for overhead um, demolition and work at Congaree Elementary. But if you recall, we brought to you the alternate of uh, building two additional classrooms cost for building those two additional classrooms is, would be $439,760. Uh, we feel that uh, it, it depends on what the office school facilities requires us to do with the replacement of wiring and that sort of thing in the hallway corridors, uh, but uh, we had high hopes of, of having 200000 of that savings and contingency. So I'd like to ask that if we can if we can salvage at least $150,000 of that, I'd like to go ahead and get approval to do the, the two classroom addition. Uh, Mr. Becker, I think, would, would verify that uh, he's going to be down to one classroom for growth. And the last thing I think that we want to do is, is start putting portables back just as soon as we finish this construction uh, at that school. So. Um, if you're willing to give us that leeway of, of trying to salvage some contingency money and just add uh, from our CPIF budget and existing funds bond money that uh, we think we're going to be able to save in other ways uh, to go ahead and do that addition. But we got to start it soon uh, if we're going to get it done. Okay. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we authorize the um, alternate bid for $431,760 for the two additional classrooms at Connolly. I have a motion, a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Madam Chair, I 
All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. And the last item on there for me, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Mike Blum from Clean Energy Collective, who's going to do a presentation on solar energy and uh, a program that we can participate in. And I've <laughs> indicated to you that there could be a savings of $131,000 uh, if we participate. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Dr. James Board. Um, my name is Mike Long, and I work with the Energy Collective. We are a developer of community solar gardens. We're in 17 states. We're working with 34 different utilities, and we've been selected by South Carolina Electric and Gas to be their contractor for the solar gardens of the building to service their customers in this area. This program was approved by the Public Utilities Commission at the end of last month. It's eligible for schools, churches, and governmental meters in addition to the residential meters to participate. There's no cost to participate. There's a subscription fee you pay monthly to be part of the program, but that will always be lower than the uh, credits you receive on your bill. We receive uh, one cent per kilowatt hour uh, for the production of our array for the next 20 years. Our agreement with South Carolina allows us to extend that agreement, but we would only subscribe to you for 20 years because we're not sure what terms it would be for the next 10. I don't know if you circulated the proposal, but as uh, Mr. Eisenhower said, the uh, opportunity for the school, if we can take all the capacity of eligible meters, would be about $131,000 a year uh, initially, and about $2.1 million over the 20-year term. It's really a great program that SCNG's put together. We've, like I said, we've done this in many states, and this is probably the easiest implementation that has ever been put together. There's, everything is handled under bill. The credit's there, the subscription's there. It's just a net savings for the school district. Um, questions? Who owns the actual equipment? They would maintain it in the event of failures, issues? Yeah, if we would own the, the property, we would own the project. Uh, the maintenance is at both us and SCNG maintaining it over the 20 years. In, in the event of failure, and I'm asking this because I've read some horror stories about other vendors, especially on the residential side, uh -huh. where they agree to, you know, buy power from this particular, you know, solar company at a great price. And then when the system goes down, they have problems getting out there, they still have to pay the regular power bill and they're still paying the agreed upon subscription price. So, yeah, so I need to make sure that I clarify one point. This, this will never be on your property. It's the property that we have in Hampton and in Springfield and in Ridgewood. I got you. So the transaction is purely financial. You'll receive a credit on your bill. Okay. Uh, our interests are aligned because the more it produces, the better off we are. So we have a good interest in making sure that it produces all the time. If for some reason there was a disaster and the array didn't produce, you wouldn't pay the subscription fee the month that it didn't produce. So this is large scale solar farms that are being shared by Yeah, 85 okay. acres, 60 acres. Gotcha. That makes sense. Thank you. And that's in the contract. Yeah. Mr. Graham. The contract is through South Carolina Electric and Gas. I say correct. Yes. So they're handling the trains that that's who's standing behind them, right? Yeah, it's it's the contracts with, with Clean Energy Collective. And um, our, we have a contract with South Carolina Electric and Gas to buy the power for 20 years. So really the first opportunity that anyone's had to participate in community solar in the state. Um, it does have an interesting opportunity to have your staff, faculty, <coughs> parents participate too as residential subscribers. So that's an opportunity that save money for them, and support renewable energy in the state. There's also developed a curriculum for K-12 for other school districts that we've worked with uh, to help them kind of a toolkit for faculty to pull from information about renewable energy and solar particularly. So we've, we've been down this path before with many schools and universities, and um, um, we're happy to talk to you about many of our experiences. How many school districts are in this program right now? So um, this, approved, this was just approved on uh, the end of April. And we have reservations now from six school districts? In this state? Yeah. 
outside of the state many more than that. But um, so far we have reservations from Hampton 1, Dorchester 2, Dorchester 4, <coughs> uh, the town of Island Palms, Oh, Blackville, Hilda School District, Charleston Department of Public Works, and hopefully you <laughs> Mr. Craig. This is also a limited program for SEG too, is that correct? Yeah. Once they get so many on their in their portfolio, then they're kind of, that's all the solar they're going to be. So they've got a lot of commitments they've made to renewables as a, as a company. This is part of their renewable portfolio. They'll retain the ownership of the renewable energy certificates. So, you know, it's part of their total renewable energy portfolio. This program has been approved by the Public Utilities Commission for 20 megawatts of power this year. And so 20 megawatts will be built this year in the three sites that we have. We're uh, hopeful that public interest will be such that SCG will expand the program next year and do this again. One other question. Um, are we locked in the 20 years? And I'll tell you why I asked that. Is my, my concern is this for me is, or could be substantial technology changes in five years that could dramatically lower the cost, you know, of the installments ourselves or maintain that or do whatever. Sure. Do they have how do you guys handle that? There's some substantial change in technology 10 years from now. Are y'all going to adjust subscription prices or what's no, our agreement is, is rock solid for 20 years with uh, with the utility, so there's no changes over time in that in that response. The, we often get the question, you know, if new technology comes along in five years, you can replace all the panels to improve production. No, we're already using tracking. You know, it's it's solar arrays like this are are designed for a 30 or 40 year lifetime. So we'll just run it and continue to run it under its current configuration. As an organization, you have a lot of options, right? One option is that in conversation with, with you, we'll understand what your energy savings goals are. We won't size this to exceed your energy savings goals so that you know, we'll build a buffer to our negotiation discussion what would be assigned to you. The second is you have the right to assign this capacity to someone else. We like it to be a similar credit structure, so I don't know. The school district next door didn't participate, and you like to assign it. So we can assign it to them if you ever wanted to get out of it. And there's also just, I want to get out of it as a cancellation fee to get out of it, which is equal to about, about five years of the production savings. So there's a lot of ways that you have flexibility to you know, get out if you want. I don't, you know, this is really a um, 20 year savings financial. You know, kind of commitment. I don't know that that, that you know that it's going to get any better. Um, in, in every state we've ever transacted in, the second program is not quite as good as the first one. The third one's not quite as good as the, as the second one. So it's usually the early adopters that get the best opportunities. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, has our attorney? the contract and the language. No, we, we can make it contingent upon that. Are you not like a contingency? Are you recommending? Tom and King and I read through this and we because we don't usually have people show up on our doorstep wanting to give us money. <laughs> uh, because so we were very skeptical. You made fun of me. <laughs> we told him when he came in, you know, we've probably seen this before, but we're going to give you a little bit of time. And basically, he said, no, I don't think you've seen this one. So, um, I, I, I have asked, I've sent the information to Mr. Bain because I know this is of interest to him. And it's way over my head. Uh, and, and I know, he, he, again, this is something of interest that, that uh, I was hoping that he would help us to kind of sift through this. But I can't see anything wrong with it. I mean, the first say the first year we saved one hundred thirty one thousand dollars, and thereafter every year it's about the same, but it decreases some over that twenty year period. We're paying in nineteen or well, twenty thousand, and we get back one hundred thirty. I, I don't know how that's wrong. I mean, <laughs> if it's legitimate, it's, it's, Mr. It's yeah, I, I've been through the numbers, and, and obviously. 
I have worked, I'm working with other entities, not the school district, but other school entities that have been looking into all sorts of solar initiatives and that sort of thing to reduce energy costs. Fundamentally, uh, if we were to buy these panels and do it ourselves, then we wouldn't, it would be about the same same nut that being two dollars and a quarter a, a watt is what or a kilowatt is what the going rate is for installation of panels if we were to do that and we were to buy it the, the net result to us would be the same thing as what they're proposing so it, it's the same thing we just don't have the headache of it. that's the way i pulled it down to then yes i recommend it <laughs> I would like to. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, 2.5 watts for your price. And uh, there's no longer any of the incentives for off-site uh, off solar available from South Carolina. Like your guess, it's one of the trade-offs they made with the this program on. So I think this is probably the best opportunity that anybody has in the state under SCNG right now. And the, the, dis or the thing is, if we don't act to do this, once you sold out your 200 megawatts, it's gone. They're not going to do it anymore. They're not going to do it for anybody else. Well, you know, the, the, not unless they I, I can't speak for discover them. that solar is tremendously cheaper than all their other means of generation of electricity. Right. It is a limited supply that they've committed to right now. I think Ms. Brandon has a good idea. I think it sounds really good, but I would like just to cover ourselves the basis a little bit if, if the attorney did look at this contract because that I think that makes us safe. Well I do agree with this fine. Motion motion continues. Mr. Bailey. I'm gonna try to make a motion if we would uh, approve the proposal to participate in the SE SC and G sponsored solar energy cooperative um, contingent upon our attorney reviewing the contract and get, getting this approval. Motion to have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Giles. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank, Thank you very so. much. Appreciate it. All right. Next is item Y. Consideration of request for out of state or overnight student travel. Mr. Hinton, please stay where you are. I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve all um, and ratify all overnight student travel is recommended by administration. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, we're going to move to administrative divisional reports. Um, Superintendent, you have no oh, report, Dr. James. Instruction, we have no report. Uh, finance. Thank you. Yes, we have our eight, our April financials and um, revenue is looking at comparison of collections on revenue. I don't have that in your packet, but I'll just let you know. Compared to the prior year, this time is uh, 1.2 million greater. So that's in the, continuing to see that trend moving. Uh, um, these are our financials for April for revenue. General Fund, I'm happy to answer any questions. If you have no questions, I'll move to expenditures. Again, we're trending well. No questions on that. We can move to the referendum expenditures to date. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on that as well. Objection, the financial reports will stand approved as submitted. 
Next, we will move on to administration and student services. You couldn't possibly have anything else about this. <laughs> <laughs> Am I correct? Madam Chair, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have regarding construction. Thank you, Mr. Eisenhower. Any questions? Uh, okay, Ms. Brown. On the selling of the old school furniture, Mr. Eisenhower, and, and this was the very last thing that you said, and, and again, I understand that there's laws, and then Mr. Sheely knows that better than any of us, but um, for lack of a better term, I mean, would it help or be beneficial or potentially just to have a huge yard sale, so to speak, and, and let teachers, families, whoever wants to come in and just buy it? For, I don't know if we can do that with our procurement, but... I mean, I certainly would rather try to get a dollar for a desk than to pay somebody to come to Troy. It's a ten. Tommy's not on his head. Tommy's not on his head. Yeah, yeah. 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 That is allowed under our procurement. We just have to publicly advertise it. It has to be a public auction. Uh, we did that a time or two before. If you'll recall, we have to secure a licensed auctioneer, or we can do it by sealed bids. Either way. There is a good bit of work to do it, but uh, there's some ways we could probably make it work without some wishes of the board, but it is allowed under our procurement. I'm not trying to recommend it. It's going to be a little complicated, but I'm just saying if we're going to pay somebody to take away, I'd rather try to make a dollar. Make a dollar. And, and we will exhaust our options to try to get uh, you know, get this into someone's home and try to, to get as much as we can out of it. The issue is, is that we're replacing half of the furniture this time. And I hate to say it, but this first half is not going to be very good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but again, we will, we, Tony, or Tommy, I'm sorry, Tony has uh, contacted all of the entities involved, uh, including the surplus property, and nobody will take any furniture by now. Greenville County School Systems ha is paying for trailer truck tractor trailer loads sitting in storage that they can't get rid of. Uh, there's there's just a glut of this on the market right now because everybody's going to this new style furniture. So um, we're going to do our best. Can to get we rid set of it. it out and let people just come grab it for free if they want to then? And, and it's less hauling off. And... I would imagine we could after we've exhausted our other options. Part, part of the problem that we have is we got to get rid of this pretty quick. Uh, after school is out, uh, we've got <coughs> construction starting, we've got new furniture coming in, we've got cleaning of uh, everything. So it, it's, it's a timing issue as well, but uh, we will be prepared, we will advertise it, and we will do the best we can to offer people the opportunity to purchase it, and if that doesn't work, then we will offer it to our employees as they would like to have it, I would assume. You okay with that, Mr. King? Of course, Mr. Davis. Mr. English. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I know that on clearing the land for the new elementary school on Cooper Drive, that we had an, there was an incident where uh, one of the residents lost their garage, and I realized it was the truck that went over it. Are we, is the district responsible for that, or the, is the contractor? The contractor has already offered uh, settlement on those, and uh, for and they've gone beyond what would normally be considered reasonable. Um, one guy had a metal building that, if you see the pictures, not uh, it's it's rusted down. Uh, they're giving him $2,000 for that building, and the guy's happy he's not going to replace the building. There was a tree that, uh, and, and basically that, that is what got damaged whenever the, the, the truck turned and some of the dirt dumped off and it ruined the fence and that metal building. I'm just concerned that there's no more fields. There, so you no. think that everything's going to be smooth there. Another, in the, in the, and I read in the paper today where you, you made a presentation and we got the... Uh, concessions on for so many work days but if we put in that contract with the contractors that there is a penalty for late completion of these facilities 
there's always uh, typically there's, there's liquidated damages, but what happens uh, is they they basically document all of the rain, um, and it's very difficult to collect on liquidated damages in most cases. Uh, but yes, there there is some penalty I'm sure involved. In I saw that you just got eight days. Does that mean that you have to go back to, to seek additional release? We, we don't have any, that's for the big pours that, of concrete for the slabs that takes place. Typically they start pouring at 3.30 in the morning and it's an all day thing. Uh, basically they, well, they finish up in the heat of the day and it's basically trying to get the, the concrete on the ground before it gets hot and it blows up on you. So those eight days is what the contractor estimates that they will need for large pours that would start as early as 3.30 in the morning. Okay, do we get to use the Saturdays to, for, for the end, until the end of construction or did they? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that, okay. With those allowances from West Columbia, do they think that this will be completed on time? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my, my biggest concern, and, I, and I've talked to the contractor about this too, and, and uh, uh, my biggest concern is that we are not According to the ordinance, we're not allowed to work beyond six o'clock, and uh, that's that's if you're making up time, that two hours to eight o'clock would add up quickly. Uh, we may have to go back to West Columbia uh, if, if we get behind and ask for a variance on that as well. We're going to try to do it without doing that. We're going to try to do it without using those eight pours. Uh, and waiting folks up in the neighborhood at 3.30 in the morning if we can afford that too. I also noticed a couple of uh, issues concerning um, um, access for trucks and fire trucks. Has that been cleared up, like at Pine Ridge? Again, we're working with Office of School Facilities and we're trying to figure out where the target is and uh, our architect has recommended the installation of one more fire hydrant and according to him that will meet the needs um, and, and the code but we're, wet, we're awaiting a response from the office of school facilities thank you Mr. Chairman. Oh, okay. um, and real quick um, i'd like the board to know this i want to compliment um, mr eisenhower because I uh, ran into two people associated with the city of West Columbia today who complimented the city since you brought that meeting. They complimented him on how he answered questions, fielded questions, his professionalism, and his manner of presentation. And I just would like to thank you for doing that good face for our district. Thank you. 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 Thank you regard to the schools that we're moving for a year. Teachers have stuff in those classrooms and uh, they may have cabinets and things because some of them don't have shelves built in and whatnot. They don't know exactly what's going to be built back. Is there going to be a place they can put them that will be in storage for a year because they may have to have them back if we don't have the facilities in their rooms. Are these personally owned cabinets and personally owned items? Yes. So in some cases, yes. In some cases, not. Uh, we're, we're trying to uh, say and hold a tight line on saying we're not taking personal stuff to these new facilities because my concern is is that five, ten years from now as folks I'm leave, not talking about the new facilities. I'm talking about the remodeled existing facilities. Teachers are in classrooms, they've got cabinets that they bought to put in because they didn't have any shelving. And so spring down some little folks that move out. And so they gotta move out, so it's got to go somewhere and they don't know what's gonna be put back, and they might have to have it. But what, do they, what are they supposed to do with it? Uh, in most cases, we're putting all new casework back in those buildings as well. And we're asking them to take those things on. And if they need them, bring them back if, if, if the principal will allow it. But you're putting in, are you conveying to them what all casework's going in their rooms? We're trying our best, yes, sir. We've been to... Uh, 
we went to Schluter River again, I guess last week, the week before, and we showed them the layouts of the rooms, and we're trying to do that with even even with uh, Davis and Taylor, they've got those same kinds of questions. So we're yes, we're trying to share that information with them as we uh, as it becomes available. Okay. Yeah, we just need to do a good job of letting them know what's going to be there, especially the ones that don't get all of the rooms that are just the, the, the same rooms they had. It's just if they're I mean if they're putting in all new casework, we need to tell them that. Well, that's that's our goal right now, and, and obviously we've still got the budget to go on Slough River and Springdale, but that's in our plans right now is to, to put all new casework, take all old casework out, put new casework in. That better meets their needs. And, you know, part of what we've seen is we've seen people that have this, these doors that open up to cabinets that then, and they stick out this far, but the cabinets like this. So we're trying to give them deeper cabinets so that they can better utilize the space that's, that's there. <coughs> And some of the teachers have expressed gratitude that you have explained it because they had lots of questions and now they feel more comfortable about it, but particularly at one school. Okay. I have one question. Okay, um, Mr. King. On the new facilities, the new press boxes, the locker rooms, and all the buildings were built. I just want to make sure we're straight. All of the exterior doors are going to be dark bronze and walls will be green at all facilities now? Yes, sir. That's, that's our district standard that we adopted. And, and really what we're trying to do, obviously we had four different architects, four different design teams. Uh, we're trying to get away from what we have now in some schools where we've got a one-hall purple door jams yellow door jams on the next one, green ones on the next one. You can't paint over those and it not be an eyesore. If someone comes and scratches it, you're going to see that base color underneath it. So we're trying to eliminate all of that. And we're trying to give the color either in the floors, where we're allowing the stripe with school colors, and if they want to do it down the hallway, in the locker room or something like that. But we're, we're just trying to get more standardized on what we're doing with those colors and eliminate some of the issues that we're dealing with right now, trying to go back and repaint. Okay. Ms. Brady. Um, I think Salute River is going to end up being our oldest school that's going to remain in use, correct? I think you don't count the high schools, but yeah. Um, I mean, interior wise, I mean, you know, I know what we talked about is kind of going in and redoing and basically, I don't know what he's talking about with casings and stuff, but do we have any kind of contingencies and stuff that when we go in there and start pulling out stuff, that I'm just a little worried. I'll tell you what Slid River is. That lady and this lady went there. So it's pretty old. Right, Miss? Very, very old. Pretty old. <laughs> very old. <laughs> so I'm just a little worried um, if they even started looking at, at any of that type of stuff. And, I mean, I'm not just talking about asbestos. I mean, I'm talking about wires and, and whatever else. And I will tell you that I'm also worried because that's what we run into in the other renovations that we've had. When we go, when we start taking out the, the, the ceiling grid, now you've got to bring that new ceiling grid up to a seismic standard. You've got to bring everything above that that the inspector can see up to the seismic standards. You've got to take out any wires that's not hanging according to code. You've got to take them down and replace them. And it's, that's part of the issue that we run into at Congaree Elementary. As you know, we're having to sprinkle that building. It's going to be much safer than it ever was, but we're still trying to figure out to what extent we're going to have to remove old things that are up there, and to what extent are we going to have to bring that existing building up to seismic standards. It's, it's, uh, it's been an issue. And uh, at Saluda River, we have some of those same concerns. Uh, and, and, you know, we're also concerned, we're answering pro uh, questions right now about traffic flow. And uh, we've had complaints from a particular neighbor in that neighborhood for, I understand, several years about traffic flow. So we're trying our best to make the best of what we have, 
given the circumstances. Uh, unfortunately, um, office school facilities is, is limited in their amount of employees that they have to review these plans and sometimes we're well into construction before we ever get an answer back on what we propose. So uh, it, it has been frustrating. I will just tell you from my standpoint, I think from Mr. King's standpoint, from the contractor and architect standpoint, trying to figure out exactly what can, what do we need to do to satisfy uh, what OSF requires. Along with Beth's question, Springdale and Slough River, are we bringing both of them schools up to a seismic B? And then are we going into here in existing? We're, we're going to do what OSF is going to require us to do. We're trying to stay out of the ceilings as much as we can. At Springdale, it's a little different from Pondery in that when we build these new additions, we're going to be able to build in three-hour walls and that sort of thing, and, and that will help us in some regards. Uh, but we're, we're still running into, you know, having to do new fire alarms in most cases. You know, the, the systems are somewhat old and they want us to bring them up to, to the boys act <coughs> fire alarm system so it's uh, unfortunately we're spending a lot of money on what i call things that aren't bricks and mortar and i feel like my job is to get as much as we can get out of our money for bricks and mortar rather than going in and fixing things that have been has been there for 40 plus years and has worked well so uh, that's just you know the, a debate that we are going through right now with uh, the Office of School Facilities. So, have you, and I guess I'm asking that question because I know with Springdale, when we talked about that, um, we were talking about the cost when you get into those classrooms, it's better to leave the classrooms intact or just redo the whole thing and what the cost difference in those was. I'm just hoping that your people who are doing all the numbers, you know, crunch those numbers as well because I'm just, I'm really worried about because it's so much older. I think it, what is it, 63? Well, years? it's also the smallest site that we have. And uh, I think it's seven acres, if I'm not mistaken. Mr. King, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think it's seven acres. And uh, when you when you consider playground space and you start trying to get stacking and all and get people off of those roads, it's difficult on seven, on seven acres with a one-story building. Um, obviously, if we could go to a two-story building somehow, uh, then that would give us a better opportunity to address those issues. Um, and, you know, as we've done in all of those budgets and all of those projects, we've looked at, you know, the cost of renovation versus the cost of replacement. And we will continue to explore those uh, as we go through. Um, and it gets close at, at times. It gets close. And if, you know, we just had a a few more million dollars, you know, it would have been nice to have gone back in and tried to look at replacing. The pro part of the problem we run into is that, and I will give you uh, Slough River, for instance, those classrooms, I think, are around 700 square feet. Today's standards would be more like 825 square feet. Uh, so it, you can't just go back and say we're going to replace square footage for square footage. When you go back and tear down and replace, you're building back considerably more square footage just to get the same number of classrooms that you currently have. So it's, it, there's a balance there, and uh, sometimes it's difficult to figure out that balance. But we are exploring several options with Slough River, um, just as we did with Springdale and, and uh, the other schools too. So. It could be an advantage to Springdale in that, or, or to Slough River in that, you know, they're going to be one of the last schools. Uh, and I said that early on, that it could, because everybody was concerned about us running out of money and not having enough to do their projects because their projects were near the end. Um, so again, that's, that's, that's kind of where we are with that. We're, we're hoping to bring you something on uh, Slough River uh, next month. But it may surprise you to walk the ground, so we'll just have to see. So you are looking at other options? <laughs> well, given the fact that, that it's small in space, yes. yes. Okay. The acreage is it's such, it's such a small site. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Isaac. 
Um, next item is human resources. And Dr. Cooper, do you have no report? All right. I believe we get to go into executive session now. I'll entertain the motion. Madam Chair, I, rec I make a motion to board trustees in a closed session for consideration of personnel appointments, reappointments, and resignations, consideration of a request for out of district tuition waiver, discussion of possible uh, contract renewal, and discussion of contractual. All right, I have a motion to have a second. Um, I, all in favor say aye. 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 We are now in executive session.